Review copy provided by Nintendo. Well, thanks a bunch, Nintendo. Flarpal? All right. All right, if we're gonna do this, let's do this. Whoosh. I have prefaced every one of my Sword and Shield related videos with this information because I feel that it's pertinent, and now that we've finally come to the full review, I am relieved that this is the final time. The last mainline Pokemon games I played were black and white. Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee eased me into a few of the series modernizations when I played it in 2018, but beyond that, I haven't had a proper Pokemon experience in over eight years. I was positively obsessed with Pokemon through the first few generations, so the idea of returning to the series after so long was a thrill. I daydreamed about the ways it might have evolved in my absence. I yearned to grab a new starter and start a brand new Pokemon adventure. Because in all my years of gaming, there have been few series where it feels quite so good to simply begin. Pokemon has a very strong gameplay loop, and that's no doubt why it struck gold all those years ago on the Game Boy. Game Freak quite simply done good. Even when we were watching ugly little colorless sprites twitch and flash at each other, the games instilled such an immense sense of freedom and adventure and potential. There have always been tons of Pokemon to choose from, and you can build your team however you want. Any Pokemon and with any moves you want to let them learn or teach them. Your team will always be unique, and it will be filled with only the coolest Pokemon, and you will train them up to be beasts and crush every bug catcher and swimmer in your path. Naturally, that exciting feeling, which is very unique to Pokemon, was present when I first booted up Sword and Shield, as it probably always will be in future titles. That's just the strength of the formula. If you saw my impressions video, you'll know that at first there were some elements I wasn't a fan of, but at the very least I was having a good time. And that remained true for the first solid chunk of the game. But at a certain point, that magical feeling started to fade, and more and more of the game's flaws started to show through. And I'm sad to say, the steady decline in my enjoyment persisted through most of the remainder of my experience. As I often do in my more critical reviews though, let's start with some of the good stuff. There's no doubt about it, the wild area is the best part of the game, and the one single thing that makes Sword and Shield anything more than an extremely basic Pokémon experience. Seeing Pokémon wandering around out in the open was probably my favorite part of Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, and here the idea is much more realized. And when you combine these two things, an actual, honest-to-goodness, open space to explore, and a ton of Pokémon visibly inhabiting it, the game starts to feel like a true modernization of the series. In the past, what Pokémon appear where has always been so rigid. Every area has grass, and in that grass, you're going to find a small handful of Pokémon with very little variation. You will find Stage 2 evolutions at the absolute most. Previously rare Pokémon will probably not appear. The Pokémon's levels will follow along with the scaling of the rest of the game. But the wild area changes all that. Here you'll see hundreds of different Pokémon as you ride around. You'll see fully evolved Pokémon, and even ones that require special circumstances to evolve, like Gengars and Flareons. And even better, depending on where you go, you'll find Pokémon that are way stronger than your party, and if you're not careful, they'll wipe you out. This is the closest Pokémon has come to feeling like the epic experience I've always daydreamed about. It taps into what I imagine the world would be like if Pokémon were real. Instead of all these constrained little video gamey paths and patches of grass, it's an actual adventure. It's an exciting experience. You've got motivation to explore, and there's actual risk involved in that exploration. No sandboxy area would be complete without stuff to do, and beyond Pokémon to catch, here you'll find items scattered all over the place. There are some predetermined ones sitting in Pokéballs, but way more than that that spawn consistently and signal you with a little sparkle. Then there are a few different kinds of NPCs to interact with and get items from. The stars of the show, however, are these weird-looking dens you find all over the place. If one is sending out a ray of light, it means you can partake in a raid battle. Here you can either team up with three other people or three CPUs to take on a Dynamaxed Pokémon. Under normal circumstances, Pokémon could only Dynamax for three turns, but these guys, for whatever reason, are permanently embiggened. 
And I must say, this idea of teaming up to beat an extra tough Pokemon is great. Beyond legendaries, Pokemon doesn't have much in the way of traditional boss battles, but this is a way to essentially fight a boss whenever you want. You earn a bunch of prizes from doing it too, so especially in the mid game, I found raid battles to be a pretty satisfying experience. And on top of everything, even if you don't do a raid battle, you still gain watts by checking Pokemon dens, which are like a secondary currency to use with specific NPCs across the wild area. So the wild area is a great advancement of the Pokemon formula in concept, but unfortunately, I do have some issues with it. One of those issues is only present, funnily enough, when you're not in the wild area. Because I have to say, compared to the wild area, the rest of the game is woefully disappointing. Going in, I anticipated a lot of familiarity. I've come to expect it with Nintendo's IPs, and I've heard people say that the games haven't really changed too much over the years. But after three generations and the jump not only to 3D, but to home consoles as well, I can't say I expected things to be quite this familiar. The game uses almost all the same sounds it always has, whether it's the chimes as you move through the menus, or the sounds your Pokémon make when they fight, or even the gross little dull thud noise when you run into something on the overworld. I'm sure this is all supposed to be nostalgic and endearing, but after all this time, it just comes off as annoying. Maybe keep like one or two tiny sounds for the sake of nostalgia, like the chime when you save or something, but having so many low quality Game Boy sound clips in your big new 3D game feels really off. Zelda reuses a lot of chimes and sounds, but at least they almost always remake each one. It would be one thing if the excessive familiarity stopped at sound effects, but it most certainly doesn't. The same applies to almost everything. I knew that outside of the wild area, the camera would be fixed and the paths would be linear, but I didn't expect it to feel this bad switching back and forth. Coming out of the wild area, I always find myself reaching for that right stick, feeling like the rug's been pulled out from under me and that precious bit of freedom I was so enjoying has been taken away. The game tries to give you this grandiose vibe, but it's almost impossible to pull off when you're running through cities and routes and only seeing the world at these fixed angles. And you can't even see where you're going when you want to run south. The map design is also as limited as ever. After all these years, it's hardly enjoyable working through these microscopic little paths with designs so basic they almost feel like placeholders, with barely any puzzles or interesting interactions to speak of. Do you want to go down this path to go forward? Or do you want to go this way and fight a trainer, then walk up this tiny path and get an item, then jump down this little ledge? Watch out though, you can't jump up the ledges. Wow. So it's the 20 year old Game Boy games, exactly, but with 3D sprites. Great. More awkward little ledges, please. <laughs> ledges forever, always. A Pokemon game without ledges is no Pokemon game I wanna play. Then battles, apart from changing camera angles, they feel exactly like they always have. And again, it's not just about aesthetics. The entire system feels sluggish and archaic. There are so many areas where they could have tightened things up, made them more quick and streamlined, but every element feels just the way it always has. That includes all the awkward pauses between actions, all the battle narration text that doesn't need to be as long as it is, all the annoying wait times as Pokemon raise their stats or are buffeted by hail or enter battle and establish their passive abilities. It's the exact same pacing we had on the Game Boy, and sometimes when there are a lot of different environmental effects and abilities affecting a battle, it can be grueling to wait through it all. If someone were to make their own version of Pokemon with identical mechanics, battles would last half the time, I guarantee it. I don't know if this is a 2D Mario kind of thing where Game Freak thinks every game needs to feel exactly the same so people will always have some sort of nostalgic connection with them, or if they just don't care to take the time to revamp the battle system, but whatever the case, the game suffers for it. Battle is still decently fun, but it comes with this constant sense that almost everything is the way it is purely for the sake of tradition, and not because it makes for a good experience. Like I said earlier, despite all these familiarity issues, I did indeed have fun with the game at first. The core formula will always be at least some amount of fun, and the wild area and raid battles were sort of boosting the experience up a little. As long as I had those new features, I thought I would enjoy this game a pretty good amount. But one of Sword and Shield's big problems for me is that almost everything good it has going for it feels less and less good as time goes on. Take the wild area, a step in the right direction, kind of exciting, all that jazz. But as I moved through the game, I kept waiting for the next wild area to open up. 
Yeah, this one's great and all, but I've explored the whole thing. And the trailer showed off a bunch of different biomes, so there must be, what, four or five of them? It wasn't until pretty late in the game when I realized that there was just the one. The trailer was just showing off different tiny little chunks in the northern region. And it's not even like you can unlock new parts of the wild area or anything. At one point, your bike gains the ability to go over water, but that doesn't do much. It just means you can reach a couple new dens and patches of grass. Yeah, the wild area is big for an area in a Pokemon game, but it's really not that big. And while the draw of running around collecting items was strong at first, after a while the game became so easy that none of it seemed to matter. I never used any of it anyway, and I could just buy whatever I wanted, so I stopped bothering to pick anything up. Why shake berries from trees when I never even used them? Setting up camp and making curry? Why? It's easier and faster just to fly to a Pokemon Center. Another problem with the wild area is that it offers you a glimmer of a cool risk and reward system by spawning really high level Pokemon, but after a while I realized that unless you have enough gym badges, you won't even be able to catch them. And I mean literally, the game won't allow you to catch them. What happened to just having high level Pokemon ignore you? Why did they have to take the option away entirely? Why give us access to these Pokemon if we can't even do anything with them? What if I just wanna breed some of them to get a baby that I can use? It's an absurd limitation that feels like it defeats some of the wild area's whole purpose. Then even raid battles lost their luster by the end of the game. When you get a raid Pokemon's health down to a certain point, they'll put up a shield and you gotta knock down however many bars before you can deal any real damage. Every attack only takes one bar regardless of how strong it is, with the exception of a Dynamaxed attack with a type advantage which takes two bars. This is fine in theory, but late game, when nearly every raid you can take part in has a five star difficulty, the Pokemon will usually put up their shield three times per battle. You'll break through, someone will land one solid hit, then it will just go back up again. Even worse, if the game decides that a Pokemon is going to put up its shield however many times, it will even stop you from dealing damage beyond each threshold. So you'll finally get lucky enough to attack between shields and land that nice big super effective hit and it will deal almost no damage because the game decided, nope, it's shield time, that's all you get. The result of all this is that late and post game raid battles with CPUs are almost never about how strong you are. They're all about whether or not your teammates happen to have Pokemon on with type advantages and if they happen to actually attack the stupid raid Pokemon instead of just buffing themselves endlessly or trying to heal each other when their health is already a max. You constantly feel like you're wasting your Dynamax because your big hits will almost never actually land. Everything you do is just agonizingly chipping away at the shields and keeping your fingers crossed that the raid Pokemon is also so stupid that it will use the wrong moves as well because if it wants to it'll just one shot the CPUs four times and end the battle. Oh, but Arlo, your problem is that you're playing with CPUs. You should be playing with people online. All right, two problems with that. One, people online are smart enough to choose type advantages and actually attack every turn, and I've yet to face even the slightest challenge in this case, so that's not very fun. That's the opposite problem. Two, yeah, it's a lot more fun with people online when I can actually connect to them. Nintendo's got all these games that you can play online now, and most of them are action games where lag, thanks to Nintendo's horrible online infrastructure, is a big problem. But here you have a turn-based game where none of that should matter at all. It should be a seamless experience. So Game Freak was like, hmm, how can we make even this a terrible online experience? I know, how about we make it super hard to connect to other people at all? It doesn't look like this is a problem for everyone, but I do know it's a problem for a lot of people and it's certainly a problem for me. When people make requests to raid battle or regular battle or trade or whatever, they send out a stamp. You can search these stamps to find stuff to do and this is how you join in online raid battles. My stamp list doesn't populate. It just doesn't. It tells me there are no stamps to find anywhere in the world. Literally none of those millions and millions of people are playing Pokemon Sword and Shield right now, sorry. There's supposed to be an option to refresh, but most of the time it's either not there or it just doesn't work. Sometimes I can force it to refresh by sending out a request to trade. The game connects and it saves, and I can rush down to the stamp search, find a raid battle, and if I'm lucky, I'll be able to join it in time. 
However, this only works maybe one in five times, and sometimes I just bounce around different trade requests, keeping my fingers crossed that one of these days I'll be able to actually find some stamps. And similarly, whenever my stamp list won't populate, I suspect my requests aren't actually going out to people because requesting help in my own raid battles almost never works. I can count on one hand the number of times I've actually had one person connect with no other takers. And remember that I've got fewer fingers than you. One single time I managed to connect with a whopping two other people and I was positively floored. Connecting with anyone at all is a rarity though. Usually I end up waiting and waiting and waiting and ultimately giving up. The entire online experience is a giant pain. And the cherry on top is the fact that when you're connected to the internet, the wild area stutters and lags and it's filled with all these weird player bots that just glitch into each other and ride around erratically. And the whole thing looks and feels like a mess. And speaking of how things look and feel, I think you know what's coming next. That's right, it's time to talk about the game's presentation. Sword and Shield has momentary flashes of quality. Even though I dislike the fixed camera, I'll admit that it forces your view onto some decently pretty vistas, especially early in the game. The world is very colorful, and it's cool to see some of its cities from far away. There's definitely a good sense of scope in places. It's fun to be in the wild area and go under a massive bridge, then later cross that same bridge and look out over the place you just were. I can really appreciate that it feels like a real connected place. There are smaller areas that look pretty good too, like a cave filled with colorful crystals or a dark forest with glowing mushrooms. Then Dynamax battles look decently nice. All the special Dynamax moves have clearly been animated with a lot more care than everything else, and I love the exploding effect when a Dynamax Pokemon faints. Some Pokemon take on alternate forms when Dynamaxing, which is called Gigantamaxing, and discovering all the different ones is a lot of fun, even if most of them are pretty goofy. But the Pokemon themselves probably look their best when you're camping. Here they've been programmed with all sorts of animations. They walk, they run, they play, they interact interact with one another, they eat curry. When Game Freak mentioned better animations as one of the reasons for the drastically cut Pokedex, it's very likely that this is what they were talking about. It gives your Pokemon a lot of personality, and I was actually kind of impressed by it. So plenty of visual aspects of the game are nice, and others are at least cromulent, but the overall experience is extremely uneven, and many elements look downright bad. There's a moment that somewhat defines Pokemon Sword and Shield, and it's right when you boot up the game for the first time. An announcer walks onto the pitch in a stadium filled with roaring spectators. This is a big, grandiose moment for the series, meant to introduce us to this wild new HD home console game. He opens his mouth, and nothing comes out. Pokemon has never had voice acting, but here is where it started to feel weird to me. Especially after seeing so many fully voiced games hit the Switch this year. Instead, you get a text box, and the sound it makes is so much louder than the crowd that the crowd starts to sound super quiet, and the whole effect instantly feels stilted and awkward. This is Pokemon Sword and Shield's presentation in a nutshell. While the wild area does offer some decent composition and design, it's the worst offender in the graphics department. It's pitifully unpolished, with muddy, low-res textures, ugly grass and foliage, trees that look like they belong in a PS2 game, and weird-looking water that just sort of turns into not water without much of a visible shoreline. The different areas have their own weather, which changes a few times a day, causing unique Pokémon to spawn, which is cool in concept, but this means that as you ride around, you'll pass through wildly different weather conditions, which will change erratically based on exactly where you're standing. It looks horrible, and it works to break the sense of openness and immersion that the wild area otherwise tries to achieve. Another immersion-breaking issue is pop-in. I understand why pop-in happens, but here it's taken to a baffling degree. Berry trees in Pokémon only appear when you're pretty darn close to them. And that's bad enough, but even worse, the distance you have to be to a Pokémon to make it appear seems to be all over the place. Sometimes the process will be smooth, and other times they'll just sprout up and shrink down at random, again based on exactly where you're standing. Like the weather, it's extremely awkward. And even worserer, this isn't even limited to the wild area. Trying to keep all those hundreds and hundreds of spawning Pokémon under control, I understand. But there is no excuse for the same to happen with NPCs in towns. Then, don't even get me started on battle animations. Like I said, it seems like most of the effort in the animation department went into camping, because in battle your Pokémon are rarely more than stiff and awkward. They'll stand completely still as their model jumps up and down or spins around, and unless you're lucky enough to be using one of the few Pokémon
Pokemon with unique animations for their moves, you're gonna be looking at a whole lot of generic repeated gestures. Yes, even after all these years, these fully rendered 3D Pokemon are standing rooted to the spot and sending intangible attacks over to each other, even when they're supposed to be tackling or scratching or biting. They're shooting bites at each other. How does that even work? I get that it would be impossible to uniquely animate every single possible Pokemon and move combination and have them all interact perfectly, but in other turn-based RPGs, they at least jump over to each other, do their generic attack animations, then jump back. None of that here, though. Pokemon battles have never looked so technically advanced, and that's exactly why they've never looked so lame and underwhelming. Many people have accused Game Freak of being lazy, but what I see here doesn't look like the work of someone who just didn't feel like making the game look nice. What I see is a game where as much was done as possible within a strict time limit. Why does some stuff look good, but other stuff look like total trash? Why does it seem like a lot of effort went into some features, but not others? Well, if my entire review of Pokemon Sword and Shield can be summed up with one single word, it's rushed. It feels like this game was put together in a massive hurry. And once again, I wish this were purely an issue of presentation, but it's not. Almost everything about the game feels hurriedly thrown together. I mentioned earlier how disappointed I was that the non-wild area, non-town places were nearly identical to the ones we saw on the Game Boy, but in a way, that's not necessarily true. You could argue that in Sword and Shield, they offer even less. You know the bigger, more dungeon-like areas in the old games? Red and Blue had the mansion, the tower, multiple caves, Sylph Co, all these huge multi-level areas, and sometimes getting through them was something of a puzzle, especially when you had to slide rocks around and send them through holes and such. I always thought some of these were a little stressful because of the random encounters, but now that they've revamped the encounter system, Sword and Shield offered the perfect opportunity to bring the dungeon idea to the next level. They could have made sprawling areas to explore, places you can spend hours in, randomly finding cool legendaries and uncovering all kinds of secrets. But nope, they didn't do that. Most of the game's roots are behind you in mere minutes. Like seriously, if you don't count battle time, you can get through most of them in like five minutes at the most. Anytime you hit a mildly interesting cave or forest or anything, you might as well start waving goodbye early. Complexity, discovery, decision making, it's all out the window here. If there is absolutely anything interesting to find, I did not find it. It's all just fight a handful of trainers, pick up a couple items and be on your way. Look at that, you're already at the next town. And the towns, apart from visual differences, all the towns are essentially the same. No interesting activities to take part in, no interesting things to see. Just roll into town, beat the gym, and be on your way to the next town. The crazy thing about the gyms themselves is that at the beginning of the game, they're super interesting. Some of the challenges they have you do to get to the gym leader are weird and unique, like competing against other trainers to catch the most Pokemon, but you enter into double battles with those trainers, so it's like you're working together, but you're also trying to sabotage them. That's such a cool idea. But then as the game continues, what should start to creep into the design but the rush. Interesting ideas fall largely by the wayside, and by the last few gyms, the game doesn't even pretend like there's a challenge. You're just fighting some trainers with nothing in between. Call me crazy, but it almost feels as if they had some cool ideas for these gym challenges, but they didn't have time to implement them all. All of these disappointing gym challenges and plain microscopic little roots are fed to you through the game's story, and I am not exaggerating when I say that it was one of the most miserable story experiences I have had with a AAA, with extremely heavy quotation marks, first or second party Nintendo game. For starters, the actual plot is almost non-existent. Almost nothing even happens through the majority of the experience, just some basic pondering about Dynamaxing and a bunch of samey stuff about trying to be a Pokemon master and all that. Then at the very end, there's a villain with super vague motivations and a thing happens and then it's just kind of done. There's almost nothing to it. And anytime something semi-interesting does happen in the story, the game is extremely careful to make sure that you don't witness it. Things will happen off screen and the characters will tell you to hurry to the next gym, they'll take care of it. Or you'll hear something, but by the time you get there, the action is done and you get to just stand around talking about it. I won't spoil anything, but at one point, something crazy starts to go down. You're literally running somewhere and people are all gathered around, staring off screen at this crazy thing you can't see, being like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. You have to get there quick. This is the craziest thing that's ever happened. And when you get there, it's over. 
Enjoy the conversation you get to have about it. Here's a little picture we drew. Doesn't that look like it would have been cool if it wasn't just a conversation and a picture? The entire experience is cheap, cheap, cheap. It feels so rushed that it might be comical if it wasn't so painfully disappointing. If a corner could be cut, they cut it. If they could get the point across by using a stock animation, they did it. Important story beat where you face a legendary Pokemon and that Pokemon needs to turn around? No problem, just swivel their model around while looping their walking animation. There's one part where someone has their Pokemon attack an elevator to get it to work, and the camera literally cuts away so the devs didn't have to animate it happening. And all this cheapness would be easier to swallow if you could just ignore the story, but the devs made sure that was entirely impossible. Throughout the entirety of the game, you are stopped by the other characters constantly. Your rival, Hop in particular, never leaves you alone, despite the fact that he's never got anything good to say. He just talks about how he's gonna be the best trainer ever and reiterates again and again where you're supposed to go and what you're supposed to do. Some of these routes are more or less straight shots from one town to another, yet Hop will stop you on your way out of town, then again at the beginning of the route, then again at the end of the route, then again when you enter the next town. Sometimes you can't take two steps without getting stopped by somebody and given another generic little spiel. At one point, they tell you to go stay in a hotel that's a single screen away. Yet when you walk outside to head over there, they stop you to tell you where it is, and then they stop you again when you get there and tell you to go inside. It's miserable, and it's 100% unnecessary. Do they think kids are so clueless that they need to be led along by the nose like this? Or did the scenario writers put all this on the page and pass it on to the programmers and call it a day? Did they just not have time to think about how it would actually play or work out the best way to do it or wonder if any of this would actually be enjoyable? I have no idea. One of the most disappointing things about this whole story situation is that even if they were absolutely set on delivering a bare bones story experience, they could have at least taken the opportunity to turn the game into a less linear affair. There are so few actual story beats that it shouldn't matter what order you visit the towns in. The wild area gave them an opportunity to link several cities together, but instead they only linked it to two cities and one of them is gated off until you find one of the later badges. Why can't I just go where I want? If I wanna go to a place where where everything is too high a level for me, why can't that be my choice? Why do I have to fight the gyms in order? They could just scale the gyms to your current skill level at the time. Or they could just not. And if you beat an extra tough gym early, good on you. Are they afraid that we'll use candies to boost our Pokemon super high to beat late game areas, then all the other areas will be boring after that? Because one, that's what obedience is for. They should have made it so that any high level Pokemon will disobey you before a certain point, but from what I've heard, it only counts for Pokemon you've received in trades. And two, that would be operating under the assumption that candies don't already compromise the entire game. Difficulty is a difficult thing when it comes to Pokemon, or really any RPG where you have unlimited access to grinding. You have to work to make yourself stronger. Being stronger than your opponent is your reward for the extra battling you put in. But that doesn't really have anything to do with skill, does it? Doesn't that just mean that you were willing to endure more tedium? How do you make a game like this more challenging without just requiring more grinding? And with Pokemon, how do you combat the fact that you can just use one single Pokemon and it will be so overleveled that you'll one-shot everything in the game? Well, Sword and Shield comes sort of close to addressing these issues in a satisfying way, but still manages to miss the mark. Universal Experience Share makes its return from Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, so less grinding is required overall. I'm pretty darn sure that because of this, there are way fewer trainers than in the old games, and thus a lot less XP to go around. When I was a kid, I would always just power level one or two guys, and the whole thing would be super easy, and I guess that was how I liked it back then. But I spent the first decent chunk of Sword and Shield with only one or two Pokemon, yet they never became overleveled. I gradually built up a bigger team, and I fought every trainer possible, yet for a good amount of the game, I found myself always about the same level as my opponents. This made for some decent challenge. But then I decided to finally start experimenting with all those experience candies I'd been winning from raid battles, and I suppose I should have stopped myself, but it's hard not to use the resources a game gives me, so just like that, the difficulty dropped to negligible levels. In order to salvage any semblance of challenge, I had to stop myself from using candies for the rest of the game. I'm conflicted here, again because of the overall conundrum of challenge versus tedium. 
I like cutting down on the grind because that's just the place I am in my life right now. I don't have time to burn grinding up every single one of my Pokemon in endless battles. XP share is actually pretty great for that, and since the Pokemon actually doing the battling gets double the XP, you're still encouraged to have each one of them do their fair share of fighting. Actually having a full team of viable fighters is a lot more fun and interesting than having one super beefy guy ever was. Similarly, when I breed a new Pokemon, do I really want to spend a ton of time grinding on wild Pokemon to get it up to the same level as my team? It's kind of nice to be able to just stuff it full of candies and watch it instantly rock it up. But there comes a point when the help becomes so helpful that you're no longer really playing the game. I don't like to grind that much, but if I take a baby and go straight to its fully evolved form with a full moveset, all sense of camaraderie and progression is gone. I have no connection with that Pokemon or the experience of raising it. Again, I could just force myself not to use candies, but if the option is there, I'm constantly going to be tempted. How much time am I willing to spend grinding before my desire for that camaraderie and progression is filled? Is there an exact number? I don't know. The idea of XP candies is fine, but by giving you unlimited candies to earn, the game throws the entire idea of difficulty and balance out of whack. Suddenly there is no balance. Levels don't matter anymore. Nothing matters anymore. You don't even have to fight trainers, just do everything using candies. Oh, but you need EVs? Well, the game provides a ton of ways to stuff your Pokemon with all the right ones in record time. In theory, I'm pretty sure you could build up a level 100 Pokemon with all perfect stats without it even setting foot in a battle. So what you're left with is a game that is absolutely perfect for someone who enjoys building a team and playing competitively. And hey, a lot of people fall into this category and they tend to love all the camping and silly interactions too. I see them all over Twitter right now. They're hunting for shinies, they're breeding for perfect IVs, they're experimenting with different builds, and they're doing it all in a fraction of the time it probably took them in the past. If there's a Pokemon that you want to battle other people with, and you want it to have perfect stats and be ready for you quickly, this is your game. And if you want to hang around camp watching your Pokemon interact with your friends and sharing all the cute stuff on social media, you can do that. This game is clearly a very great experience for social Pokemon players. But I'm not one of those people. I don't care about shinies or perfect stats or curry. I just want to play a cool adventure game that's balanced in any sort of way so that the experience is fun. And that's not what this game is. I might be willing to put in at least some additional effort to customize my Pokemon a bit. I've dabbled with EV training in the past. But why would I do that when I can just overlevel my Pokemon instead? It seems to me that if I want to have any sort of challenge, I have to do a Nuzlocke or something. But I don't want to go that far, I just want a game that doesn't feel like it was made for babies. So I could try to come up with a bunch of my own personal rules that limit how many candies I can use, and maybe other items as well. I could look online and try to find just the right rule set, and I could playtest it and try to strike just the right balance. Or I could stop playing the game. Game Freak could have put together a few difficulty modes for us, even something as simple as kid and grown-up modes. But nope. If I want to have fun with their game, I've got to put in a lot of effort, and the rest of the game isn't nearly enjoyable enough for me to want to do that. At another time in my life, I probably would have found all this pretty fun, and I might have gotten into all the social aspects. But that's not me right now. Right now, I just want to play a good video game. And if a game isn't very fun because it's not very well designed, I'm not willing to force it. I'd rather just go play one of the thousand games on my backlog or return to a game that I already enjoy. I'm not going to go into the whole thing because I covered it quite thoroughly in my video, Pokemon has a Pokemon problem, but it is worth mentioning at least once. Pokemon is the single most profitable media franchise in the history of media. These games sell millions and millions of copies, substantially more than some other major AAA franchises from mega gaming corporations. And yet never in my life have I played a game that came from a company so large and yet felt so cheap. I've certainly never played such a cheap game flying the Nintendo banner. It's not about the decks, it's not even just about the graphics. The entire package feels so rushed and devoid of compelling content to the point where it feels a little cynical. It's already bad enough that they would be willing to ship such an unpolished game because meeting a holiday deadline is more important than giving us a product that they can honestly be proud of and that we'll all greatly enjoy. It's already bad enough that the series has grown to the point where the games release just about every year and the deadlines are 100% non-negotiable. It's already bad enough that they only want to incrementally improve upon these games because they know that will make them easier to 
release every year, and everyone will buy them anyway, so it doesn't really matter what they do. But can't they at least hire some more people to help with the world design and flesh things out a little? I don't know what Game Freak's development team looks like, but I do know that other annualized series in the industry have multiple, separate, large studios working on multiple games at once. That way, even if their games are kind of samey and have to meet those deadlines, they're at least full, content-rich, AAA experiences issues of over-monetization aside. Even if they want to keep pumping out Pokémon after Pokémon, iterating at a snail's pace, can't they at least put in more than a hurried slapdash effort? Can't they at least make it a full game? Because I went into Pokémon Sword and Shield excited to get back into the series. But honestly, if this game accurately represents what Pokémon is now, I don't think I like Pokémon anymore. I don't think I want to play any more of them. If I could put down the series for eight years and skip two whole generations, then come back and still feel this been there, done that kind of feeling, I can't imagine that feeling is going to go away in the next entry or the next or the next. How many years do I need to wait before it feels fresh again? 12 years? 15? Was the jump from 2D to 3D not enough? Now I need to wait until Pokemon goes full VR or something? And even familiarity aside, if future titles feel like they were designed and written over the course of a weekend and churned out in a year and a half, then I'm definitely not interested in the series anymore. If I let myself, no joke, this review could be as long as my big fat review of Breath of the Wild. It would be fun to further explore what I do like about the game, all the stuff that works. And, of course, there's a lot more disappointing stuff I didn't talk about. Because yes, even after everything I've said so far, I've still got more I could say. Like, okay, they animated walk and run animations for every single Pokemon, so why can't they follow us like in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee? <laughs> it's baffling! I can't even tell you how much I loved it, and its absence here is downright painful. And the post-game? A couple conversations and copy-paste raid battles, then the battle tower is all you get? Super meager. And this might sound petty, <laughs> but I really really don't like the new Pokemon. And I'm not even one of those people who hates every new Pokemon after Gen 1 or 2 or whatever. There are always a few stinkers in each new batch, but also tons and tons that I think are really cool. But not here. Themed Pokemon are the worst, and nearly every single Galar Pokemon is themed, and they're all goofy and cartoony and dumb. I told myself that I would only catch and train Pokemon that were new to me and that I honestly liked, but after a while I had to cheat and go with a bunch that I only half liked, because there just weren't enough that I full liked. Oh cool, a little rock guy with a wheel, that's interesting. Oh, now he's a minecart. Great! Whoa, a ghost dragon? That's rad! What's he turn into? Okay, now he shoots babies out of his head. <laughs> Radical! Ah, uh, see what I mean? I love my complaining, but I do need to stop sometime. As I've said many times by now, there was something of a good time to be had in Pokémon Sword and Shield. The core Pokémon formula is intact, and as long as it is, these games will be at least a certain amount of fun. I did have fun with parts of the game, especially in the first half. But when that fun factor doesn't extend very far beyond the expected baseline, I lose interest. Not to mention if that fun factor sharply declines by the time the credits roll. At its best, it's at least as fun as any Pokemon game is going to be, but not much more than that. Depending on what you're looking for in your Pokemon games, you might have a great time with Sword and Shield. Lots of people are having a great time with it, and more power to them. <laughs> I'm actually kind of jealous, but I'm done with it. There's nothing left for it to give me. Even as I record this, I have this little itch to boot the game back up again and do some more raid battles and raise up a new Pokémon or two, but then I remember that I would have a hard time connecting to anyone and how none of my efforts would amount to anything because I'm done with the story and there's nothing left to do, so I don't bother. I feel the draw to play it, then the reality of what playing it would be like sets in and I don't want to anymore. And that might just be the most depressing part of this whole thing. The spunky 10-year-old Pokémon trainer inside me can't quite seem to accept that the awesome new Pokémon adventure he was supposed to go on doesn't exist. I give Pokémon Sword and Shield a middle-of-the-road 4 out of 7. So that's it. The game has been reviewed, it is done, and I can finally stop talking about it and thinking about it. I can just drop it and move on. At least until I make this one other video about Pokemon I have planned, and it talks about Sword and Shield a whole lot. Uh, but after that, I swear I'm done. For a while.